you know, there's no rumors going around. Past so you want to go with it then? I'll probably make a comment. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome back to the Side by Side Guys Off-Road Podcast. I am Big Z. I'm Ian with Full Throttle Battery. And this is episode four of the podcast, and I am super excited to get into some of these topics that we have lined up. How about you? Very excited. Came back from SEMA. Uh, took about three, four days for the voice to recover, but yeah. uh, we're good to go. <laughs> you talking, or are you just yelling and screaming like a little girl at all the cool stuff you're seeing? Yes. <laughs> All right, so uh, just a little preview into our next episode. Uh, we're going to be covering the holidays that are coming up. We have a lot of really great uh, opportunities for the community to buy into things that are on sale and, and affordable. So uh, we got Black Friday coming up. We got Cyber Monday coming up. Um, if you're any of the astute consumers out there, you'll know that uh, Black Friday and Cyber Monday mean November. So a lot of uh, great opportunities to buy this month. And then we have Christmas coming up. We're going to be coming out with some top pick lists of uh, maybe some stocking stuffers and uh, maybe some high quality Christmas gifts for your UTV loving partner. Um, so look forward to that. Uh, I know that th that'll be a great time. We have the podcast that so we're going to review that stuff on, but we'll also be publishing on our website a number of different articles for you to link to, uh, as well as uh, posting on all of our social and uh, other channels. So if you're not already subscribed, subscribe to Side by Side Guys uh, on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and all the places. All of the platforms. All right. So like you had mentioned, you just uh, got back from SEMA, but you had a little bit of a surprise going into that. I assume you're talking about the X3RC. Someone got a new ride. Yeah, yeah. Big, uh, big news. Yeah, I, uh, I've been kind of looking towards jumping into a new car, new build. Um, and the X3, I, after doing research, after driving all these rigs, I kind of felt like it was going to be the one that, I mean, heck, we covered it in the last episode. And you right. noticed that I pretty much referred yeah. everything to the RC. I just felt like it was a great uh, great car to do everything that I wanted to do. Currently, I've got about 50 miles on it somewhere in there. And uh, so far, very happy with it. It's been a lot of fun. Uh, it's kind of confirmed my... Uh, you know, kind of your gut it, feeling? Yeah, it's validated uh, kind of my thought on what I was going to be able to get out of it. So let's just review so. it real quick because uh, we talked a lot about uh, all current models last time, right? Mm -hmm. So all 2020 releases. Uh, but you jumped into a 2019 yeah. Can-Am Maverick. And here we go with the ABCs of Can-Am naming. The Can-Am Maverick X3 X RC Turbo R. 72-incher, 172 horsepower. I got a screaming deal on it. Yeah. Yeah, screaming deal. You know, I was looking at the RR, and the more I looked at places like what Evo's doing, what Boondocker's doing, what Packard's doing, um, I figured the horsepower number that I wanted to target was totally attainable with this car, and right. it's going to be purpose-built. You know, I want something that's going to be a dune slayer, but, you know, for every mile I drive in sand dunes, I'll probably drive 50 in the mountains, so it needs to be able to serve both functions. And I think this is going to do it really well. Yeah, and that car, um, you know, the, the engine block and all that is the same on both the RR 2019, or um, 2020 RR and the 2019 r you know, variants, right. they're all the same blocks. Right. So they all have the same potential, right? right. Uh, and so the 2020 came out with a bunch of upgrades on the turbos, on the on the tubing, and all the different uh, little knickknacks that go into making a turbo put out a lot of power, right? Right. So um, there's even guys taking 2020 components and putting them on 19s. Yeah, you know, I somebody could correct me, but to the best of my knowledge, there was a different turbo, different injectors, different pistons, and... You know, for the most part, that's kind of where the uh, bread and butter was in the differences between the two years. Right. So, but I have seen some footage out there, some guys that I know that have 18s and 19s that are very, very fast mm -hmm. and a moderately tuned RR yep. is getting them. Yep. It's beating E85 cars. Yep. Very impressive. So yeah. That, there's that, a lot of headroom in that, in that, that ecosystem. Yeah. So. That new RR is quick. <laughs> so you had mentioned before <clears throat> that you had the Maxxis Liberty tires on your YXZ. Yep. And uh, this one comes stock with 30 inch yep. max celebrities. Yep. And, and so you still feel like that's the tire for you? For me, it is. Absolutely. Um, if there's one thing that I'm very pleasantly surprised about is I've kind of talked about the X3, kind of how it felt like it had a little bit of body roll. Yep. Felt like it was a little loose. I, I think I used the term hurting the waterbed. 
I am pleasantly surprised with the way that that thing handles. Like I've thrown it into corners that uh, I was tackling in my YXZ at, let's say like 55 miles an hour, feeling very stable, going to it at the same speed in this thing and just the utmost confidence. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that machine comes with the Fox Podium 2.5 RC2s, uh, 2.5 in the front and 3.0 in the back, right. which is right. uh, something that I really like seeing is the 3.0s in the back, where many of the manufacturers are going to just the 2.0s or the 2.5s all the way around. Right. Uh, and the 3.0s do give you a lot more um, flow and a lot more movement right. uh, and a lot more adjustment. Um, in that range, the the scale is a lot better. So uh, 24 inches of travel and up to 24 inches of travel in the back is a great number, right? That's something that can has definitely been touting. Right. And, you know, one of the things that I wanted, I wanted a car that I could really attack whoops with a lot of speed, a lot of momentum and have that stability. And I, I put it to the test over the weekend and um, threw it into some of the most violent whoops that were out of rhythm. You know, they were, they were gapped at different distances and I was charging them anywhere from uh, moderate whoops, whoops uh, anywhere up to about 70, 75 miles an hour. Um, and the most violent ones I was doing anywhere from 45 to 55. It would just depend on how comfortable I was. You know, it, it, it it's violent. It'll beat yeah. the heck out of you, but the car will do it. No problem. Whereas, you know, I'm not, you know how much I loved my YXZ, mm -hmm. but the uh, YXZ would have really got bucked around in that stuff, you right. know. And I don't even think if you were to throw a long travel onto a YXZ, it would be able to handle it the way that the X3 does. So I was looking at uh, before the show. I was looking at a um, a YXZ that had the Reflex Plus Ten suspension upgrade on it, and if you were to have ten more inches of width on that car and that additional travel, do you think that would have changed maybe your um, decision going into a new car? Or do you think that would have um, simply just kind of mitigated some of the annoyances and then still you would have felt like you were missing out on something? I, you know, I've talked to people that are running long travel on YXEs and they say that it's a totally different animal in the whoops, people that are, you know, very reputable that I would trust. Um, the problem is with that proposal is if we were to take my car, and this is the main reason why I jumped to an X3, if we were to take my car and upgrade it to do what it, exactly what it is that I want it done, you're talking a long travel kit, which can range from $2,500 to $5,000. Right. You're talking uh, suspension modifications, having the shocks revalved. That's probably on the low side, about $1,600. Um, if not replacing the shocks, if not replace it. Well, and I would, because I was running the X twos, the X twos, there's not a lot of tuners that can do much with that X two. So I would probably switch to what is it? The SE or something like that. Right. Um, the, uh, and as far as the motor goes, the stock engine on a 2017, which basically a 2016 through a 2018, the most boost that you're going to run on a car like that is about seven, maybe six before you're going to basically blow it up. So you'd have to take that motor apart. You'd have to change out all those internals so you can run some real boost. So all in, it would have cost me $15,000, give or take, to do right. everything that I wanted with that car. And everything that I would want to do to that car is to make it more like what an X3 can already do. Right. And that's why I jumped to it. Right. Now, the big thing that's going to be determined over the course of the next two years is the YXE is bulletproof. So unbelievably tough. And we're going to see whether or not that X3 can kind of hold up to it from a durability standpoint. I've, I, I ride with a lot of guys on X3s. They go through the same stuff I do. I, I, I have high expectations. Right. And it's not like it's a 16 or a 17 X3, right, where they were going through right. learning phases of the high output motors and the high output torque so they've they've learned all their lessons along the way up to this point and, right and it's not the next jump which they did with the 20s right and so they're not they're not going to be proving their block over the next year you're on something that's proven upgraded and, and stout enough right. to to take the abuse right 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 now granted we didn't go out for like a 50 mile ride or anything but you got to ride in it and then you got to drive it so kind of initially just yeah so we did a, a quick little walk around on that vehicle up at your place right and the, f the first impressions were um you know it's a beautiful car for one it's one of the best looking chassis out there um i personally am a, a fan of the turbo s kind of look where it's a little bit more boxy a little bit more upright a little bit more um trucky feeling um, but as far as more aggressive and, and kind of the sexiness factor, the, the X3 definitely has it. And, uh, while I give you crap all the time for the Smurf blue on that, on that car, it's, uh, it definitely is not a bad look. It's not a bad look. Yeah. Uh, it's, so, it's growing on me too. I, yeah. 
Yeah, so it's not bad. And, and uh, you know, we got out there. Uh, that thing, I think, had like three miles on it when we were looking at it or whatever. And uh, shocks weren't adjusted yet. You know, preload wasn't adjusted. All that stuff hadn't been gone through yet. So my first impressions are based off of that scenario, the dealership scenario, right? Um, but the thing that uh, kind of impressed me was um, you could feather that throttle and and scoot away if you wanted to. But if you just felt like having an itch and, and pressing that pedal in all as fast as you wanted, it would go as fast as you wanted. So uh, the the aggressiveness uh, of that motor and that transmission seems to be uh, pretty wild. It comes alive a little quicker than you thought. That I thought too. You yeah, know, yeah. I, I've I'm used eight. to that linear pattern, yeah, right? Yeah, a little bit of turbo lag, and I think mine comes alive a little bit quicker than some of the ones that I've driven in the past. Yeah, the, the pleasant. pressure buildup is a lot faster yeah. than I would have expected. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we did we test drove it. And I want to say it was 14 degrees outside. Oh, God, it was frigid. That was terrible. But <laughs> <laughs> that was really the only negative part about that walk around. It was right. awfully cold. Yeah, it was a cold day for sure. And, you know, we let it warm up and all that before we rode it. But uh, And we weren't, like, putting it through its paces or anything. It wasn't going over rocks or right. through whoops or anything. We were just going down the, the field ripping. or whatever. So kind of just wide open. Right. Uh, the belt wasn't even broken in yet. So Yeah, and I kind of am breaking that car in the same way I broke my YXC in. It's more or less like heat cycles. Right. You know, I'll run it up to operating temperature, and I'll shut it down for a half hour. Then I'll run right. it up to operating temperature and shut it down for a half an hour. And that's kind of how I broke in the YXC. And, you know, there's kind of two rules of thumb in breaking these cars in. Some will say don't, don't let it see 6,000 RPM for its first 20 hours. Uh, Yamaha is very similar. Like, don't let it see 6,000 uh, 6, RPM, 7,000 RPM. And then there's the guys out there like, run it like you're going to drive it. It has it has more to do with heat cycles than it does actual RPM and getting those yeah. valves to seat. Yeah, so. definitely. There's there's a lot of things to consider when braking a new vehicle, including brake wear-in and things like that, where you want to be considerate of um, getting them hot but not stopping things like that. Right. Uh, but as far as just belt and, and, you know, your clutch break in and all that stuff, it's more, it's more about temperature right. and, and letting it cycle and get stretched out. Cause that's really what, what it's doing is it's expanding and contracting uh, a number of times to get settled and then it'll be a good, reliable unit. Right. Right. So, yeah. Uh, you know, I think when I drove it, it was still in four wheel drive. I don't think I ever took it out of two into two. Um, and I think that if I did on that gravel road, I probably would have scared the crap out of myself, but I think you'd have been pleasantly surprised. Like on that gravel, it, it, it does okay. It's very predictable. In sand, in sand, two wheel drive was useless. Yeah. You know, I'm running those liberties. I was running them about, I want to say like. Well, I would, I would say pounds. your liberties were useless in the sand. <laughs> well, yeah, so the sand changed conditions while I was out there. When I got there, it was wet. It when looked I, like it was wet. Yeah. yeah. And when I left, it was dry. So the rear end of the car behaves totally different between wet and dry sand. The, the rear end of the car, I'll get a little bit more movement the drier the sand gets, but it's still totally predictable. Yeah. So did you find, uh, and just for those that are up here in the Pacific Northwest with us, I think you went out to Moses Lake, right? Yeah. Um, which is a great whoopy little area to kind of cut in and out of stuff it's not like big you know dune hills or anything like that but it's definitely somewhere where you can beat the crap out of your machine if you want to um and uh the the sand out there is not that like uh super soft west coast sand it's definitely it's got some dirt in it it's definitely a little more aggressive so right. when it's wet it's definitely more packed it's tacky yep and when it's when it's dry it, it tends to um slip out from under you but it doesn't go deep yeah yeah there people are all over the board on moses lake some people love it some people are very fond of it they'll go to other places like juniper or they'll go up into the mountains um moses like anybody that talks bad about the moses lake sand dunes i just assume you either don't like to jump or you don't like to go fast because that's what you do out there and you've got right. the room to do it you, if you got a room that you can stretch your legs in it's it's actually a pretty fun place you know it's a good place to dial your machine in good place to uh just kind of get a feel uh like i said jumping though like when i was in motocross that was a place i like to go because there were some good hits out there yeah for sure did you have any time to uh, get into the adjustment of the shocks or anything like that when you went out to Moses? Or Nothing yet. Not yet. Nothing yet. So I remember when I was driving it, it felt like maybe the um, uh, the rebound was a little bit loose. Uh, did that impact your dune riding at all? No. Or? No. I uh, we, we threw it off a couple of jumps. We uh, were throwing it in some berms. Um, you know, I... I it, it, the way that I set this car up, if it's anything the way that I used to set up motocross bikes, it's going to be on, it's going to be very, very rigid. It's going to be very stiff. You know, I like a lot of feedback. So, 
you know, I'll definitely have to kind of touch on that, get a little contrast before adjustment, after adjustment, but the car, uh, the car is super predictable. And I, I have already, like I said, I, I think it's only got about 50 miles on it. I've already thrown that thing into moguls that the YXE, my YXE wouldn't have tolerated, wouldn't have, really? it would have bucked. It would have, I mean, you probably run the chance of having an accident. I do mean, you, do you attribute that to your shocks or do you attribute that to your longer wheelbase? Wheelbase. Yeah. I think it's wheelbase. And it, obviously I think shocks play a, play a big factor in it, but uh, the wheelbase definitely helps. I mean, don't get me wrong. I mean, it, at 80 miles an hour at 55 miles an hour in violent whoops, it's violent. You're getting right. thrown around, Yep. but, uh, you know, the car handles, it holds the line really well. If there's one complaint that I have about it and it's totally fixable, the stock harnesses on that thing are terrible. Terrible I in a fit or in <laughs> terrible a, like, all the way across the board. Just everything. Yeah. About yeah. They've got that retractable harness yep. and I'm, I'm sure for like the casual person that jumps into a rig like this, if he's just going to be going up around Priest Lake and kind of putting around, it's probably more than adequate. Um, no. No, I mean, I'm a big fit. I'm a big fan of the retractable harnesses as far as the usability and functionality of it. Yeah. You run the clip up on top and I've got it cinched around my waist. It'll still creep up on you. And next thing you know, the clip up top's choking you. Gotcha. (laughs) So, so yeah, I mean, I, I, a lot of that came from the fact that we were, we were on the gas. Right. So like any machine, there's always going to be things that you're going to want to upgrade and replace and make more your own. So seats and harnesses are the first no question about it. That'll be the, yeah. the first upgrade. So the seats seem to be fairly usable, but they were very kind of rigid and and not um, giving in any way. Like they were. Right. They seem to be more like you were sitting in something meant for an alien, and then if you happen to kind of fit the alien form, you were good. Yeah. Uh, you were in my YXE. I had those G Force seats, and right. that's where I'm going with this one. Yeah, and those seats were definitely very huggable seats. They yeah. had a lot of bolster on the sides. It's and, a big upgrade. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, so you got that and then you put it in the trailer and you went to SEMA. Oh yeah. 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 So uh, I didn't take the machine down there. No, 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 yeah, no, no. You, yeah. you locked her up for oh, the yeah, week yeah, and then yeah. you took put off. It, put it in the garage and, uh, yeah, we're, I was down at SEMA, got there Monday, left Saturday. Um, I would love to tell you this amazing story about how I got to walk all over this event and take it all in, but uh, it was the busiest SEMA by far of the three that I've been to. Uh, outstanding for the company. We we it's going to be great. We've got a lot of stuff to follow up on. Yeah. But uh, the owner and I got out for probably about an hour to two hours and got to check out. Probably I'm guessing we got to check out maybe about sixty percent of the show, both inside and outside. So, and when you say sixty percent, you're referring to the sixty percent you know about, not 60, the, everything oh, else that grows outside absolutely, of it. <laughs> absolutely, yeah, sixty percent of that show basically you saw nothing. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but enough to see some stuff that kind of stuck out. So, 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 see, you know, those kind of shows are first of all a place to show off and and get eyeballs on your products, but also it's a networking event, right? Um, has has SEMA over the years become more and more of a networking event, or has it become less and less of uh, a broad networking event and more of a specific? Event? like event where you're there to see a handful of people and then the rest of it's just kind of, you know, media relations. I would say it is 70% networking uh, in terms of how we get interacted with what people bring to us is it's about 70%. So it's, it, I mean, honestly, we would have to reevaluate if it was anything different. You know, I, I feel like uh, it, a guy could go to a salesperson or something like that could go to a show like SEMA and just walk it, shake some hands, have some success. I have no doubt we haven't explored that yet, but there's definitely, there's, there's benefit for us to be there. For and, sure. And uh, we had a lot of people, a lot of people coming to the booth to check us out. A lot of people that wanted to work with us both from a media standpoint, sponsorship standpoint, and right. a distribution standpoint. So it was great. How about the customer education side of it is that something that customers come looking for knowledge or are they coming just to see what's kind of what car is going in what kind of builds are they doing like how was the customer expectation on that so the first couple of years it was that it was kind of educating people about who we are this year it's more they they already know who we are you know very very few people swung by the booth that weren't familiar with us familiar with what we got going on familiar with the the avenues that we're marketing into so it's been obviously we've been doing a pretty good job over the last three four years of get, sure. getting information about who we are and what we do out there so yeah and you guys have been in some pretty high profile rigs yeah. as of the last year or so so yeah uh, a lot of eyeballs there so you went to SEMA and you saw uh, you know a handful of things what were your uh, what was your kind of overall vibe for the UTV industry at SEMA? Like, it's been a growing presence. 
Like where was where was the f- the vibe at, at the show? Yeah, you know, it wasn't like something that was discussed, but you did see a lot of UTVs all the way across the board. You saw virtually every machine known to man that's made at that event, um, particularly in the audio section. Like uh, if you go downstairs and you go by the kicker, the Rockford booth, uh, Wet Sounds, uh, every one of those places had a UTV build in their booth. Uh, I want to say it was... Uh, Oh, I'll think of it in a minute. I want to say it was Powerbase. It might have been Powerbase had right. a uh, four door had a four door Ranger in there that was lifted beyond all belief, and I, I it's more spe- speakers and stuff in that <laughs> and you can shake a stick at. Uh, wet sounds, wet sounds. You know, you're not supposed to turn your volume up at SEMA. You can get in trouble. Right. So they packed all the audio people into one place, and it's kind of understood that every right. once in a while they're gonna it, someone's it, gonna hit it. In, in audio, we call it burping. Yeah. And uh, wet sounds had a boat there that they. Or, <laughs> no, it wasn't a boat. I'm sorry. It was a, it was a old. It was an old Chevy Blazer with a old Chevy trailer that was the uh, short wide box that was the diesel brothers truck wasn't it i'm not sure but all yeah. i know is that thing that thing was like spl which is sound pressure level uh that was thing was like spl loud like yeah, yeah. when they would burp that thing everybody's like whoa yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah, if i remember correctly that came from a build that the diesel brothers did on their show oh that's awesome and was released at the time of sema so it all kind of correlated together uh, and then that trailer, I believe, is all subs or all tower speakers or something like that. They they must have hidden. They must have hit it. I I didn't. It is so packed in that main floor area that I didn't get like right up on it, but I was right next to it from you to me when they burped it. Yeah. And uh, and you knew it was there. Well, I've been to so many audio contests. <laughs> like bass is just one of those things. Eh. Uh, he's not loud. Eh, he's loud. This was loud. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I was impressed. And coming from the pro audio world, you know, having uh, an appreciation for cleanliness of that signal coming and hitting your body, right? Like That's key. There's plenty of guys that can just make stuff yeah. mud and make your stomach feel sick, but there's guys out there that can put a punch in your chest and let you know they're there and let you feel it for another 10 minutes after you leave. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of companies doing aftermarket stuff for audio and UTV and some of those systems you'll hop into and... It can get very loud, but it can be distorted. It, you know, it everything has to be relatively cost conscious. Right. But you know, if you know what you're doing, you know how to build an audio setup. You can get some bass and you can get some mid range in a UTV setup. Um, there's a couple guys here in the Pacific Northwest. I mean, granted, the price ranges range from anywhere from about thirty five hundred up to eight grand. I mean, there's right. one, there's one guy I want to say he's in Portland. He's got a a, a Max. He's got eight thousand dollars stereo and it sounds as good as any car you'll ever ride in. It's right. oh, it's unbelievable. And that's but, one of the biggest things like people don't understand about. UTV audio is that uh, that high range, mid range is easy to achieve with any system. Right. It's getting that clear, clean, heavy hitting bass that makes you like feel the music. That's almost impossible unless you know exactly what you're doing to generate uh, the sub frequencies out of something that is basically floating in the air. Right. Uh, whereas in a, in a van, truck, SUV, something like that, you're more planted. You have more of a, um, you know, a box, a speaker box to, to compress that air in. Yeah. Whereas you're out in the open on a UTV, you don't have right. that option. So. Right. And not to do, uh, do like a spoiler alert or anything like that, but uh, I, I've got some follow up to do. But it sounds like my X3 is probably going to have some thump to it, having some some music to go well, along with it. You know, and I've never heard a two seater. I mean, I know it exists, but I haven't seen it yet. A two seater that's got some bass to it. And right. I want to change that. <laughs> yeah. Usually there's only uh typically there's only three ways to achieve bass in a UTV. One of them is to put something behind the firewall if your engine has space for it. So like uh JL has a rip behind the firewall sub right. that you would put in like a XP one thousand or a turbo or something like that where there's an actual gap and you can cut it into the firewall. The second way is to take all the space out of your bed and have basically a shelf and no longer have any storage. Or three, to have tower speakers which then don't have bass. Uh, bass. Yeah. They're they're a hit, they're not a thump. Bass is a function of an enclosure and my my YXZ had 3,500 miles on it. I started to think about it. I'm like, did I have a passenger in that car for even 300 <laughs> of that 3,500? And uh, I could probably say no. Right. And so I started thinking, how about we just rip that seat out and throw a big <laughs> enclosure, maybe a 12 in there or something to yeah, get that definitely. thing thumping. But you could at least do try to do something under the seat or exactly, something. Exactly. Exactly. So, uh, you know, SEMA is one of those things where you either hate it or you love it or you understand it at the very least. And I can um, touch on that. It is 
overwhelming. First couple of years, I, I kind of felt like it was one of those things where I was kind of worn out after the first couple of days. It was so good for me to walk it this year. I mean, I didn't get to cover it the way that, you know, most patrons would go in and cover it, but the owner and I got to walk around and I got kind of a new, I got revitalized a little bit on the show because uh, I hear that show referred to as a bucket list item so much. And I, I always kind of, I, I don't correct people, but I'm like, oh boy, you don't even know what you're in for. It's, it's that right. big. And, and going out, going out this year was fantastic. It was really good to get out and kind of mingle, shake some hands. And I think the biggest difference is, is we got to see all the people that we're working with. We got to see them in their booth. We got to see those bills. I'm like, hey, you can go to Monsters of the South and look at their, de- I think it's, they got a Defender. Um, th- that thing's ridiculous. It's like, man, I want to say like 40 inch tires or something. Yeah, they it's were the, pretty massive. Oh my gosh, yeah, 30 inch rims or something. I can't even remember. It, it's completely the, it, useless tires and rims, but. Oh, I, I'll, I'll challenge you on that. They'll, they'll figure out a way to use that thing. For sure. Um, I, I can't even wrap my head around that build. Uh, they, it was referred to, I think there's a hashtag called the UTV that broke SEMA, and they're referring to that that car. It, w- it was pretty nuts. And it was outside. It was right in front of Ford. Right. So. Yeah, and it had uh, adjustable shocks and airbags oh, yeah. and oh, yeah. all sorts of stuff on it. It had four of our Group 31s in its bed, and each one of those things weigh about 67 pounds, somewhere in there. So they had one serious air ride set up on that thing, but it, yeah. it was crazy, crazy. Yeah, it was a pretty crazy machine. Oh, we'll, yeah. have to, we'll have to do a ride on it or yeah, something like that. for sure. So what, what were your three takeaways? Like, what were, your, what were the three things that stick out in your head that you enjoyed spending time with or seeing or interacting with well i saw an old sunbeam tiger 289 sunbeam tiger i've never seen one in person and uh, it was one of those cars that my dad my friend my dad's friends and stuff would kind of talk about because one of them had it so when i when i spotted it i kind of spent some time looking it over that was kind of a neat treat um our neighbor our neighbor is the your full throttle booth yes uh had this uh basically what they do is they build like drill bits, like titanium drill bits for oil rigs and uh, they drill into the ground. Well, obviously somebody at that company is an enthusiast of the off-road and they started developing titanium axles for UTV, specifically the X3. So that, that was a, eye opener for sure. I don't even think they're selling to the public yet. Um, I don't even want to know what those cost, but (laughs) you know, titanium and axles, uh, the first thing that popped in my head is, you know, where's your next weak point you right. know so i mean that could be something that had to get addressed but it was really really cool to see that yeah the the big thing with axles is that you know it's usually not the physical bar that breaks it's usually the knuckle or sure. the, the cv or something sure. um but when you upgrade those to something that's hardened and, and proven uh then you're talking about twist and reflex right and there are certain scenarios where um having a, such a stiff metal as titanium uh, may be uh, an awesome option, especially like for racing right. or doing torque-based speed things. Uh, but there's other situations like rock crawling where having a little bit of flex and not having the shatter effect uh, would be a beneficial thing. So a titanium axle is definitely something that's very cool and, and I think would be an amazing opportunity to try out and, and see how it feels and, and works in the different situations. But um, there's definitely going to be a market for it. And, and don't just think that just because it's titanium, it's the thing to buy. Right. Um, it, for one, will be super expensive. And, and for two, uh, more than likely going to result in a bro- blown transmission. So. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, uh, the last thing that really kind of blew me away is the same thing that so brad and doug to last year they built i want to say it was like an f-350 chase truck and the panels like on the bed the side panels would lift up and expose a toolbox i saw that last yep. year and that was yeah. oh it was awesome. in the booth again this year was it yeah and and in the 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 rear bumper slides out and you've got all your toe straps and stuff it was so well thought out it's just right. such a cool truck and this year uh, they did another build. They did a two-wheel drive uh, Toyota pickup, extra cab. Um, I think Brad put a about an 800, 900 horsepower NASCAR motor in it. Oh, it, really? Yeah. I mean, it's not something you can buy. And it was this. I I just implore people go to uh, go to the Deberti Instagram, Brad Brad Deberti, Doug Deberti, and check out that Toyota. It is so over the top it was so cool oh i just brought it up yeah i yeah. remember seeing that that's a that's a pretty tricked out unit it's insane yeah they it, put the wide insane. body on it yeah yeah that's pretty sick yeah 
Definitely not an off-road vehicle. No, no. But uh, yeah, very, very impressive. I can't wait to see some footage of it ripping it. And the, and I just want to speak to, um, you know, going back to that whole haters and lovers of SEMA um, and people that understand it. Uh, when you see somebody like the DeBerties come out with that truck and have the bed or the, the side panels go up and you have that really well thought out toolbox, this wasn't a result of somebody just having a wild imagination saying, hey, I should put a toolbox in the side panel of my truck. It was the result of people out doing things and having a need and then realizing they could meet that need with some ingenuity and and some fabrication and then putting that into practice and coming out with a, with a result that you can actually show off, right? Yeah. And it's not it, – something like this is not um, something you would show off at – any kind of just random off-road show, you'd want to show it off at a place where there's industry experts and people that are in the industry doing things to come and see it and validate it and promote it and be able to put their their experience behind it as well. So uh, that's you know what really SEMA is all about. For there's a whole section for just showing off and being silly and extravagant and off the off the charts. But the rest of the show is all about. How can we be creative to solve problems? What what new things can we put out to make your life better, your experience better, things like that? And and I think that there's plenty of vendors at the shows that are doing that. Yeah, for the DeBerti Ford, it, it's outside of the Southwest. You get outside of the Southwest there, you know, the concept of a chase vehicle. Maybe people have been exposed to it. Maybe they haven't. But obviously, people that are in, in embedded into that, in embedded into Baja racing, desert racing, they put a lot of thought into what's going to be convenient for a chase truck. And I, I think the the birdies perfected it. Like yeah, they really sure. got they really got everybody thinking about what's possible with that car with that F three fifty. You know, the funny thing is where my headspace with that truck was. Um, yeah, there there's the whole chase truck aspect of it, but there's a lot of racers that are on a budget. And they're trying to do things without investing a million dollars on a trailer and, you know, $150,000 in tools to stock the trailer. And then, you know, another $150,000 on a truck to pull the trailer. Like they're, they're, they're strapping everything together. And these types of fixes, these types of solutions to where am I going to store that? How am I going to carry that kind of all play out on that scene as well. So all those guys that are trying to come up in the industry, start off, you know, low and work their way high, you know, solutions like that, while that, exact implementation would probably be pretty spendy to implement uh, it may create more ideas and more solutions and For more sure. more things that people can then implement in their day-to-day life yep if, if we want to move on here i'll just throw a little bit uh we had uh the blake wilkie bug in our booth and that thing was a magnet you know uh, blake's car is a uh, it's a modified class five so if you don't know what a class five is it it's a score truck basically like a score bug based um, race car. And, uh, so it's a modified class five. Obviously that thing does not have a 1600 CC motor. In it. Right. <laughs> they, uh, I, I can't remember what he put in that LS two or something, LS two, LS three, and it's got a blower on it. It's pushing just shy of 600 horsepower to the rear wheels. It's got an A arm kit on it. Uh, and if you've ever, I mean, any, you spend any time on Instagram and check out, uh, you'll see tons of tons of videos of that thing. Sh- just tearing Glamis apart. It's such a cool rig, and it brought a ton of people in, ton of people in. Everybody's familiar with it from the content that he right. develops. And and on the last day, my back was about giving out, and coincidentally, it makes for a great place to sleep under. So I crawled <laughs> under it, and, and uh, no, I didn't sleep, but uh, it took about a 10-minute break under there and was totally comfortable. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, it, it one of those things that uh, that I've noticed is that anybody can build a crazy car. Anybody can throw money at it. But there's, there's very few times where you can see a car that actually conveys the person's passion, and that car does, like to a T. Like yep. if you walk up to that car, not knowing who Blake is, not knowing who what Shreddy Life is or anything else, like if you walk up to that car and we're just to look at it or maybe even hear it start up or whatever – you could get a pretty good idea of the person that was building that car. For sure. Like that car conveys yeah. who built it. Yeah, he's, got, he's got a Volkswagen tattoo on his foot. You know, it's a big <laughs> part of who he is. Yeah, For sure. Yeah. But I just want to speak to that because there's so many people that just build stuff and they just put on whatever brand they want and they or whoever's going to put free stuff on their car or whatever. And I guess that kind of also conveys 
who those people are yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, but you know, that's the stuff that excites me is when you can see a car and you see the person behind it without ever meeting the person. Right. Right. Yeah. And when I built when I built the YXE, I wanted to kind of I kind of implemented a little bit of everything into it. I wanted to ex- uh, just kind of explore like a lot of different parts, a lot of different components, see how they work. But at the root of it, I, I really wanted the car to kind of represent like what I was going for. I did some kind of unique goofy stuff. I mean, this has nothing to do with a build, but like if you looked at the uh, the roof of my car, right. it had a flag sticker of everywhere I've ever driven a UTV. So it had every state, which is a lot. Yeah, for sure. It had a state uh, flag of every place that I've ever been from a UTV and, and ridden off-road. Uh, right. just, just little unique yeah, there's stuff d- like that's that. one thing that uh, I think is one of the stakeholders of the UTV industry is the fact that, uh, for one, everyone's UTV is different. They make it their own. They make it to what you know their personality or comfort level is or whatever. Uh, but they also they don't. Everyone's UTV tells a story, right? Like everyone's car either says I stay in the garage all day, or I go out every weekend, or I don't know how to control my throttle and I flip it every weekend. Like everyone's car tells a story and especially the people uh, that take the time to uh, document via their car, right? Like putting the States on their, on their roof or putting um, the people that they meet, putting their sticker on their car and then creating, you know, a, a t- almost a histogram of where they've been, what they've done. It's that old, uh, uh, what was it? The, the eighties where people, seventies, eighties where people were putting the stickers on the back of their vans while they were traveling the United States or whatever. Yeah. Uh, I think that's the modern version of that. And uh, it's always cool to, to, to go to group events and seeing everybody's cars and the stories that they tell and, and meeting the people behind it. Because like you said, like I said, it, it, it conveys who they are and, and their personality and, and, and what they're doing out there. So Right, right. Yeah, it's so interesting with people's builds too. Like I've seen cars that have been very, very, they've been beaten on, but mechanically they're just top notch because the guy, right. the guy, takes care of it in that fashion. Whereas I've also seen cars that, uh, they're, they're almost like that particular owner's 57 Chevy, right? You know, basically I'm building it. I rub it down with a diaper. I never drive it. Right. I saw a few of the, uh, I saw a couple of those, uh, at an event this summer and it kind of got me head scratching because there's a place for that. You know, I'm, I mean, you, you, you commented on haters, some of those guys get a little bit of hate because they're not on the trail, they're not out riding. But I mean, like I said, that's his that's his '69 Camaro, you know. And right. like I was at an event this summer, and a guy had matching X3 Maxes on 35 inch uh, 35 inch tires. Uh, I mean, you know how much an XRS Max costs? Probably talking thirty thousand dollars. He had two of them, and both of them have the exact same parts on it, and it had there was nothing. Uh, nothing spared wheels and tires air pumper uh intercom radio cage roof rack everything and like <laughs> i felt kind of bad but he came up and he goes uh do you guys do any sort of sponsorships and i, I looked at him i go i don't know does that thing get dirty <laughs> you right. know I, I felt kind of bad but no i mean like i said there there there's guys that are that are basically just building these things and that's the hobby you know maybe they're not going out there and and tearing them up the way that we do but uh we need those guys we need those people in the the industry and and like i said i felt a little bit bad but nonetheless it (laughs) 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 oh well (laughs) well some of the biggest news to come out of sema this year outside of just the various little product changes and new releases and whatnot was that we have a new player in the utv game and uh kind of out of left field no one saw it coming and uh you know last episode i think i was quoted in saying so uh, it's pretty rare to get new vehicles at this point you know last episode we were talking about kind of just which units to pick right and and we said that there's not going to be really any new surprises that for the rest of the year till maybe spring yeah and then here we come sema and there's a surprise i didn't see it coming yeah so segue <laughs> Uh, the inventors of the gyroscopic personal transport devices uh, that kind of revolutionized the technology that goes into um, gyroscopic balancing of, of electronic objects um, came out with a few different things, actually. Um, their big push right up front that they kind of teased to everybody was more of an electric dirt bike. Um, and then that came out. And then they also uh, surprised everybody with an, a hybrid setup on an ATV quad, on a utility vehicle, um, 
UTV and then also a sport side by side. So just to kind of hit them up real quick, we have uh, the Snarl ATV just because it's not really our segment, but uh, it's a 570 cc uh, single cylinder four stroke engine with a permanent magnet synchronized motor, which is what uh, the hybrid part of the motor is. Uh, it's basically an electric motor coupled to the drive shaft to then provide additional torque when needed, right? Um, providing 70, uh, 86 horsepower, 70 foot pound of torque. Um, the rest of the specs aren't you know, anything amazing, but they also came out with a thousand CC twin cylinder four stroke, 107 horsepower variant as well. So if any of you guys are out, uh, in the quad industry, you know, that's definitely something to look at going into next season. But, um, uh, I, I'm not necessarily in that market. So, uh, the next thing that came out was the Fugelman. I'm pretty sure I'm saying that right. Fugelman. Interesting name. Um, and so they came out with three different variants of that. And this is a uh, utility UTV with some sporty aspects to it. So I compare this to a uh, Polaris Ranger or a Canon Defender or something like that, um, where it's more utility oriented, but does have a little bit of the comfort and sportiness of a sport side by side. So they came out with a 570 cc four stroke single cylinder variant as well, which produces 86 horsepower and 71 foot pound of torque. It'll come with the uh, what you would consider standard feature set of a UTV these days, which is two wheel, four wheel drive, engine braking, uh, front and rear A arms. Uh, the this unit comes with 11 inches of travel, um, 27 inch tires with 28s optional. Which that doesn't make sense to me. Why would you have a one inch variant as an option? I mean, go bigger or just don't do it. Um, 13 in, a little over little under 14 inches of clearance. Um, it'll be more of a, kind of a feature upgrade to do a digital touchscreen. So they'll have a 10 inch touchscreen option. Uh, 81 inch wheelbase, 1600 pounds dry weight, um, 550 pound bed capacity with a uh, 1200 cargo capacity. So it's kind of like the entry level version. And then they came out with a 1000 cc variant that puts out 181 horsepower with 184 foot pound of torque. That's interesting. That's a lot of torque. So by comparison, if you were to take a 2019 uh, Honda Civic Si, the stock horsepower on that is 200. Was it like 200? A little over 200 I'm horsepower. Surprised it's over 200. The foot pounds of <laughs> torque on that car is 192. So this is like six less than that, and it weighs about the same. It looks like it weighs about the same as the new Kawasaki. I want to say it's just shy of 2,000 pounds. So the new Kawasaki, uh, I think, weighs in around 1950. Yeah. Yeah, and this it's, thing's right in there. So it's actually a few hundred pounds less than that. So it's 1650 on the base model, but the higher end versions um, actually don't change on their on their weight that much. So. Uh, I'm looking. At, it says it says 1936 on the dry weight on the uh, villain, the SSV. Because uh, I'm still on the Fugelman. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Look at me jumping <laughs> ahead. <laughs> we'll get there. We'll, we'll get, get there. there. Yeah. You, I, I, as soon as you said 181 horse, I just blacked out. In, right. Like, tunnel vision. So. <laughs> So what they've done is they've come out with uh, kind of three motors that they're working with both um, on the Fugelman and then the Villain. And we'll get to the Villain in a second. But So they came out with the 570cc uh, with the uh, assisted magnetic motor drive. Um, and then they came out with the 1000cc version with the same mag magnetic synchronous motor, but at 181 horsepower, the 180 foot pound of torque. And that's why it was interesting because even if you look at the competition, if you look at a Polaris Ranger, uh, you know, you're looking at it 62 foot pound of torque. If you're looking at a Can-Am Defender XTP, uh, you're only looking at 69 foot pound of torque. Um, and you look at something like a Kawasaki Mule or anything else, they're all just worlds apart from that number. Like 180 foot pounds of torque is just insane, especially with something that weighs 1600 pounds. Right. Um, and, and the thing of like that number doesn't translate to horsepower as in like through the power band, it's like, it's all up front, right? That torque is in that first 10% of takeoff or right. whatever you're doing. So when you look at the fact that, um, you know, you're being, you're able to load the bed up with 300 pounds or 700 pounds of cargo or whatever. Um, or even if you're pulling 1500 pounds, 2000 pounds on a two inch hitch, 
that torque is going to make a huge difference on the way that it feels and operates around the job site or the farm or the whatever you're using uh, that vehicle on. So uh, no no price point provided yet. That's still a secret. Um, but if you look at the competition out there, you're looking at anywhere between fifteen to twenty three thousand dollars for a utility with some sport ness to it. Um, so let's get on to the villain where you know our uh, the villain X three. So <laughs> <laughs> jumping ahead, I'll, sorry, we'll get there. We'll sorry. get there. <laughs> uh, so they came out with the villain and what they're calling the SSV, which I'm pretty sure they're calling it a sport something vehicle like I'm, i don't know where this s is coming from but super sport uh, vehicle super sport maybe which is funny because their website also has a menu that says side by side and then underneath it it's the villain so i'm not sure where this ssv is coming from but it's a 1000 cc uh four stroke twin cylinder motor uh we got 181 horsepower with 184 pound of torque just like we were talking in the fugelman uh but it's going to be you know that transmission is going to be geared a little bit different it's not going to be all just low end torque it's going to be kind of that more broad torque um, you know, again, the dual, uh, front a arms, uh, radius rods, trailing arms, just kind of like your standard setup on any sport UTV nowadays, uh, 14 inch aluminum bead locks are an option. Uh, they have 29 inch tires with thirties optional. Again, I don't understand why you'd go one inch, which if you measured out with a tape measure, it's probably gonna be half an inch difference. Um, but, uh, 1900 pounds, dry weight, 102 inch wheelbase. 64 inch and 72 inch options, which is interesting because they didn't show any 72 inch options in their uh, booths. I noticed that. So uh, I don't know if that was an afterthought <laughs> or if they were just like, uh, we'll just throw that in there and see if people want it. Yeah. 300 pound payload capacity with 748 towing capacity. Uh, something super interesting is that they're going to be a full chromoly frame. Yeah. So the entire chassis will be chromoly chrom tubing. Um, and then they came out with a non hybrid version as well so they have a non-magnetically driven version which is the thousand the same thousand cc motor uh but with only 107 horsepower and 72 foot pound torque so i thought that was interesting why would you want to differentiate yourself as a hybrid company and then come out with a gas only option money that's that's my guess is a, a you know if if this is going to be like maybe about a thirty to thirty two thousand dollar machine maybe there's some a piece of the market that they don't want to give up on for the people that are going to be somewhere in the twenty thousand dollar range that's possible so yeah so the to me if they come out with both the hybrid version and the non hybrid version they're kind of saying to the market we understand that people will buy UTVs based off simply the way they look, the way they feel, the way they drive, not necessarily based off the technology built into them. And so I think that's where they're going with it. There's going to be the guys that want that hybrid, and then there's guys that don't want to be called tree huggers. So um, I just don't see why you would want to pay, unless there's a significant price difference in that setup, I don't see why anybody would want to go from 181 horsepower and 184 feet pound of torque right. and almost cut that in half. Right. So I don't see those selling a whole lot, but uh, we'll see. So if we if we take a look at the comparison to competition, uh, you know, like I said, the price range on those two models, the competition range is anywhere between twenty to roughly twenty eight thousand um, dollars. You know, that's everyone always says, "Why is the industry getting so expensive?" Well, the machines are stinking trophy trucks, basically. So right. uh, that's why they're expensive. If we're going to bring a hybrid from a new company that doesn't have mass production efficiencies, you know, we're probably going to see that price range anywhere between 35, maybe even 40. Potentially. I mean, uh, if we look at the Nikola NZT, NZT, yeah, uh, those were being spec at 80,000 up. and Which everybody, that's in everybody's range. I mean, yeah. it's just money. <laughs> right. Everybody can get that. So, um I, I foresee them trying to be a little bit elevated above everybody. That's kind of Segway's thing. You know, we're a little bit better. We're a little bit more tech focused. So we're going to charge a little bit of a premium. Uh, so I'm estimating in that 35 to 40 range, it may be lower. I doubt it. That's just not there. And that's not normally their playbook. But um, so if we look at the competition, we're looking at anywhere between um, 112 to 168 horsepower. If you go from the broad gambit. 
But most of the high high end competition that these would be competing with are in that 160 to 195 horsepower range, right? But none of them have that torque. Right. And that torque off the racing line would be an interesting concept. So if you were able to work on these motors without really interfering with the technology that's built into them and build them up to a race spec car, I could I could foresee a lot of drag races lost to these. Yeah. Uh, it's funny talking about drag racing, kind of how things have evolved over the last 20 to 25 years. Um, when I was in high school, which was a millennium ago, um, our high school actually had a drag racing team. And on that team... Wait a minute. Your oh, high yeah. school had a drag I'm racing dead, team? Dead serious, man. I am going to the wrong school yeah, yeah. where I was. So if you ran a 14-second quarter mile when I was a kid, you were fast. If you ran a 13... That's fast nowadays. Oh, yeah. If you ran a 13-second quarter mile, you were really fast. If you were running a 12-second quarter mile, you were a legend. And there was only one right. kid in the car co- and uh, had a... Uh, dart swinger 340 that would push nice i want to say it was like 12 12 5 somewhere in there but uh, a lot of the kids were anywhere from about 14 3 to about 14 8 and they were considered fast a toyota camry hybrid will do like 14 1 so that's how things have changed you know i mean even some of the new honda accords uh everything's quick these days i mean my my f my f-150 is a 14.6 car. <laughs> so it's just amazing kind of where things are going. But, you know, you, you touched on it earlier. I think price point's going to be dictated on this thing. Uh, people are going to take that into consideration. But that torque number is astronomical for the UTV market. And I, I completely agree with you. I think that uh, coming off the line for the guys that want to go up hills, the guys that want to do some drag racing, this thing's going to be quick, real quick. You know, it, it kind of brings up the question that we talked about earlier about those titanium axles, right? If you're putting that much torque down, what's going to fail? That's the first thing I thought. I'm like, it will, what's going to blow up when you're when you're getting on that thing? That's it's going right. to be built pretty pretty tough, no no doubt about and it. And we're talking about a company that's new to the industry, right? I mean, not even like kind of new to the industry, like completely new. new to the industry, right? And uh, and when I say that, I mean like even their electric dirt bikes are not made by them; they're made by somebody else, somebody that they invested into their company and are just rebranding. So. Um, they don't have the customer support side of the things. They don't have, you know, the blown transmission cases. They don't have the blown belts, which I don't think I ever saw anything saying that it was specifically a belt driven. I'm assuming it's belt driven. Yeah, I'm not 100% sure. I have not seen any pictures or video or coverage of the actual motor in any aspect. Like even in the booth, like the engine is hidden in a way that you can't see it. Yeah. So... I'll be really interested to see what that motor looks like, how it performs. Um, and then just something I noticed while we were prepping for the show was how much the Segway villain looks like a Can-Am X3. From the side, yeah. And when I was watching the video that they, they generated, uh, it's on their website. You can check it out. Uh, they show that car from the side and... Uh, I don't know. I'm sure you're going to put this up on the YouTube page. Take a look at these things side by side. There is some distinct similarities yeah so everybody that's listening and not watching we're, we're looking at the the segway villain next to a can mx3 side by side and it looks almost identical like you could definitely see how someone could take that that chassis and just change a few things and maybe make some upgrades or adjustments or compromises in a couple different ways and end up with this vehicle like it's just uncanny how much this looks like a cousin of an X3. Right, right. Yeah, and when I was checking out the website, there was a picture of the villain from uh, from the back, and uh, I don't know if you got a chance to check that out or not. It It is slick. I, like, I thought it looked really good from the back. It was very cool. I would say that they've done a really great job of making this a very approachable-looking vehicle. Yeah. Like, it's, it's not off-putting in any way. There's no, like, super, like, we're from the future and brought you our car type look. Um, I would I would say that the uh, Nikola has a little bit of that, that little bit of uh, we have a little bit of the past, but we're trying to really force the future on you. Um, and this doesn't. This has really more of a. If you took the Can Am and all the aggressive lines of it, and then just smoothed them out, that's what it looks like. Yeah. If you take that front end and you smooth out the yeah. dips and cuts and all that, that's what the front end looks like. Yeah. I, I, 
you know, it's funny that you touched on that because that's exactly what I was thinking when I saw it from the front. It kind of has a little bit of a flowy uh, line to it, similar to a talon. You know how a talon doesn't, uh, especially up front, I didn't really feel like the talon had a lot of uh, jagged edges or anything like that. Almost flows like a Volkswagen. swoopy. Almost kind of like a Volkswagen bug where where it kind of, yeah, just kind of rolls up to the front. I I thought the Segway kind of had a little similar line to that. It looked good. Yeah, the it definitely looks acceptable in my book. Like, and it, but I'm I'm curious on this new trend. So, in when Polaris brought out their Pro XP, they brought this like doubled up B pillar. Yeah, and plastics that come up with it, and the Segway comes yeah we one can't step see further. That. Yeah. like they're they're covering that B pillar and bringing the plastic all the way up and around, which I thought was really interesting. Like, I don't understand why they're doing this. Like, the industry seems to be adopting this like stronger shoulder look. Um. But uh, but yeah, back back to what I was saying. It, it's uncanny if you'd have the time to take a look between the X3 and the Segway's villain and tell me that it doesn't look like Can-Am's making their villain for them. <laughs> like it right. just looks like they are. Right. The mount points, the shock towers, the trailing arm placements all look exactly the same. Uh, the plastics look like they've been moved around a little bit, like moved back to cover the engine a little bit, a little bit more. But you know, as far as the actual unit. Um, it's very similar. So, yeah, that's my one regret from SEMA is I didn't get a chance to hit that booth and go check it out. You know, I'd, I'd yeah. be honest with you, I couldn't find it. <laughs> so. Yeah, when when you have a new player in the game, even if they put down a lot of money, they're usually tucked away in a corner in a side building or in a parking lot or something like. They're just when you're when you're trying to hide stuff, they don't put you out front center. So right, right. So, uh, anyways, no pricing. Pricing's to be determined. Um, to be competitive, we hope that they stay under 40. Otherwise, they have no chance in hell in the United States market in, in any aspect, I don't think. But I do think that the hybrid powertrain is where the industry is going. I think that that's where we're going to all end up at some point in time. You know, you were uh, that's a conversation topic a little bit later. And uh, I, I think that uh, I, I think you might be on to something there. Um, I, I would in- insist people don't reject this technology. I, it, it, I, I would embrace it. It if you've ever been in a hybrid car, you see how much torque those things have, uh, power potential out of those things. It's, 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 it's impressive, you know, and hopefully we get a little eyes on. Maybe these guys start showing up to some events and we can go out and take these things right. for a spin and see what they're all about. So. Everybody always wants more torque, more horsepower, all yeah. that, more high output. But the thing that people keep running into is the fact that the manufacturers are never going to go over a liter. Yeah. Their, their motors are never going to be that big. Right. And so this is one way that you can bring the 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 torque and the power um into the equation without increasing the liter size of the motor um and then if you look into the future and you look at the possibilities of uh, all-wheel drive and torque vectoring and all that kind of stuff um you know the capabilities of the machine in five years could be astronomically better than they are today if this type of technology is adopted well and implement and the r d goes into it um we're looking at a lot of vendors like Can-Am, Polaris, all those guys putting a lot of money into R&D for their next generation. Um, and Polaris has already even said that like they're putting a ton of money into batteries. Like They have GEM products like the, the EV vehicles for uh, transport, but there's nothing stopping them from putting that tech into their power sport products. And I think that, you know, there'll probably be a generation be- between now and then that is like triple cylinder or something like that. But I foresee a day where they're going to be coming out with these magnetically assisted motors that are going to put your cheeks back in the back of your head and bring that smile even bigger than it ever has been. Wheelie standers. So, I mean, this kind of brings up the topic of kind of the state of the industry in our, in our sport, right? So, uh, the UTV industry has really taken off like wildfire the last few years. Um, you know, Polaris started it in 2008, something like that. Give or take. Uh, with the uh, 900 or the 500, whatever it yeah. was. Um, and then uh, as soon as the uh, industry, off-road industry s- decided they wanted something cheaper for the weekends, uh, it really took off uh, in 2015 uh, is when I think it kind of exploded um, and has just been steadily climbing and climbing uh, all the way up to present day, right? So, um, you know, if we take a look back at the state of the industry, it's kind of a fun topic to talk about is, is where, have, where have we come and where are we going and, and what do we see in the future, right? So talking about the segue coming into, into the market, it really brings in kind of the confirmation I had of <clears throat> those assisted motors coming to play. Um, and, I, and again, I, I really do think that the future does have that. Um, as far as 
a new vendor, do we have enough vendors in the industry to really support the aggressive growth that the industry is going to be demanding of it in the next five years? I think we do. Uh, I think the the obvious player the obviously uh, obvious oe that isn't involved in it is suzuki and you know suzuki brought fuel injection to motocross to quad cross i mean like the ltr quad was something to deal with you know it was lower it was wider it ran that 450 fuel injected motor i would love i personally i because i i've driven I, i've owned suzuki motorcycles and stuff i would love for them to get involved in this because uh, i think it'd be so interesting to see where they took it but in terms of uh you know one thing that you talked about is what are the two, you know, what does two new players mean? Obviously, everybody's competing for uh, market share and a market share that's growing, growing very rapidly. So right. I, I, I don't think multiple manufacturers jumping into this is going to harm anything, water anything down whatsoever. I think it's just going to basically uh, give us, the end user, better choices. So let, let's talk about the idea of who's pushing the boundaries and pushing the industry forward, right? So we have the original OEs. Uh, you know, Polaris, Honda, Kawasaki, they were all technically in the utility vehicle market. And then Polaris pushed the game to the next level and created the sport side by side. And then we had players come in. We had Can-Am jump on board. Um, Kawasaki would say that they did, but I don't really consider a Terex a full sport side by side. Right. Neither would um, they. Yeah. And uh, then you had Honda jump in recently. You had Yamaha jump in. You had uh, Kawasaki this year jump in with the Terex. You had uh, Nikola says they're coming in, but I, I'm not even sure that'll ever come to market. Um, we have the new Segway. We have who else am I missing here? We have uh, Yamaha, Can-Am, Polar. You, you touched it. Yeah. So I mean, we have the major players as we know them, right? There, everybody that we would have expected and recently not expected to jump in um, would is that enough guerrilla strength in the industry to push the next version, the next generation of UTV uh, sports side by sides, things like that? Um, because honestly, the only people that are putting money into this are the ones that are the big guys, right? The big OEs, Polaris, Can Am. And I would I would also argue the fact that only Polaris is putting in the sheer strength of and volume of dollars into their R and D. No one else is putting anywhere near that amount of money into it. So um, you know they're they're talking about you know thirty million dollars in R and D this last year alone, let alone next year and the year after, right? So um, with players like Segway coming on, we're talking about bringing technology into the motor. Whereas before, we never really had technology in the motor. It, it was, was in the suspension. It was in the suspension or it was in the ECU or... You know, Ride command. Something like yeah. that, where it's like an auxiliary system that complements the powertrain or complements the suspension. Right. Um, and so Segway's bringing technology into the motor. And then Nikola was saying, we don't want engines, we want only electric motors. So um, again, just for everyone's clarification, I'm not considering Nikola an actual player because they haven't come out with something and i know segway isn't at least come out with something at this price range because it's a proven technology all they have to do is copy paste and put their motor in it um so does the industry grow in the next year or two technology wise or does it stay still until somebody revolutionizes it like we've talked about before in the past evolutions episodes, versus revolutions evolutions versus revolutions yeah. right so even the Segway component, I feel, is an evolution. Uh, it's the same gasoline-driven motor, just with an electronic assist flywheel on it, basically. Um, are we going to see somebody come out with something newer, bigger, better? Or is it going to be just one more small step, one more small step until we're so saturated with used units that no one really cares anymore? Yeah, honestly, I could see where it was... You know, we've had this talk. It's actually one of the first talks we had about the old evolution versus revolution. I, I kind of maintain that the uh, the revolutions were the 2014 XP1000 and the YXE. Uh, the YXE because it, it, it a clutch, a tra you know, an actual uh, manual transmission. And 
I think the XP1 in 2014 turned everything upside down. <laughs> I'll, I'll kind of quote uh, an industry partner, a, a buddy of mine named uh, Russell Porter. He owns Buggy Whip. He said, uh, he made a comment to me once that UTV is single-handedly saving off-road. And I, I would tend to agree with that, no, no doubt about it. But in terms of where this stuff is going, I, I, I would tend to agree with you that it's probably going to take the step of uh, evolution. Seeing a hybrid motor in this, I mean, honestly... I, I think it's five years maybe ahead of its time. And I would definitely agree with you about Polaris kind of driving. Uh, I, I mean, being in the position that we're in, we get we get our hands on a lot of rumors. And there's some rumors coming out. Some of the stuff that Polaris is working on right now that's very intriguing. No right. question about it. I mean, I mean, we're talking new platform. You know, and mind you, these are just rumors, so it's not even worth discussing. But uh, I, I think things are going to go towards uh, more travel, more horsepower, um, probably more purpose built. Like, I mean, you know, you, you touched on something on one of the last episodes about how there, there isn't like a dedicated OE building a dune car. Right. I mean, why not? You right. know, I mean, that could be a real thing. You know, I mean, Yamaha did announce a new rig that was a little bit more catered towards woods riding. Why not jump into something that's towards almost a hundred percent built towards, uh, towards sand market, sport market. Um, I would like to, I would like to see, more OEs aside, I mean, obviously Honda's doing it on their four seater and Polaris is doing it on the dynamics, but I would like to see everything go to live suspension. I mean, unless you've actually been in a car that has live suspension, you don't know what you're missing. It's right. awesome. For sure. <laughs> it's and, awesome. And all the, the manufacturers are starting to do that now that uh, the licensing has opened up on the live valve technology with Fox, right? Yeah. And it's only a matter of time before the other manufacturers of the of the the primary manufacturers of shocks will come out Walker with their, King. of their controlled units as right. well too so right. everything i believe right now is all you know um bosch controlled ecu type control units uh so anyone that uses those aka 90 percent of the industry right. uh will be able to can be compatible with that and i foresee that everybody's top tier unit to have that within the next year or two yeah um and i think some of these oes are going to kind of get directed and uh based on where king and where uh, Walker Evans kind of take their technology. I mean, I think th they're going to play a big role into how this stuff evolves as well. Right. So, yeah. And I foresee, you know, going back kind of to the, the topic of, you know, market specific units uh, with, the, with the Dune car. Like, which is such a foreign concept to me, like that somebody would build a Dune specific car. And then right. just the more I think about it, I'm like, it. Makes, be, it could be it makes a, a lot of sense to me like yeah. not necessarily that that market's huge but the fact that they would cater to a market mm -hmm. because i mean look at the the always now they make a standard entry level unit they make a more advanced trail unit they make a mud unit and they make a rock crawling unit all the big always make those four types of units those are all market segment oriented builds right and all they are just little adaptations, a little bit of sw you know swap in and out type plug and play and components. And you can cross platforms. And then you're now a tar a market targeted platform, right? right? So there's no reason stopping anybody from making either a dune car or uh, even more aggressive rock car like a rock bouncer esque or um, you know super trail focused, not just general for trail focused, but just purely 100 percent trail focused. Um, I think that. If you look at what's going on with the um, packaging options that are happening, so like uh, when Polaris came out with their Pro XP, uh, they announced that they're not really doing uh, a lot of very like letter variants. They're doing package variants. Yep. And so you have the Pro XP, you have the Pro XP Premium and the Pro XP Ultimate. They're all the same car. Right. But they just have additional accessories built in to cater to different markets. Fosgate. It makes me start to wonder if we're going to start seeing rugged radio at an OE level which I think that'd be fantastic. Right, exactly. And and each each which is a great indicator for the aftermarket, right? Like the fact that the OEs are going to start start considering aftermarket as a plug and play component to their OE vehicles uh, is only great news for them. Like right. it just means their market's going to grow even bigger. And then their accessory market and their upgrade market's just going to grow even bigger. So, um, as far as the aftermarket, I think their future is super bright. Brighter than it ever has been, right? Um, but, uh, I think we're going to end up seeing, uh, because with these, like I was saying, these, these new packages that are coming out with, um, Polaris did it, um, Kawasaki's doing it, um, Yamaha's doing it with their, what do they call it? The XTR or, or whatever it's called. Yep. Um, 
those are all basically just rebranded, repackaged versions of what they already have. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that like with Polaris, the pro platform is going to do that for them. They're going to get, it's going to give them the chassis. It's going to give them the wheel, the wheelbase, the horsepower, the torque that they need for every single market. And they'll just adapt the suspension, the travel, the whatever to that market. Um, which I'd also be curious to see if that moves into the dealer side. Like if that becomes like the dealers get shipped X number of units, they're all base platform units and then they get shipped whatever upgrade packages they order, assuming their market's going to be different than everybody else's market. Yeah. Some of them are doing that already, you know, down in California, you got places, uh, you got UTV shops down there that are basically getting in these units and doing a full customization on it. And you see it at Sandsport a lot. You'll go through a wing and there'll be a dealership that just takes up that entire wing and they're selling X3s, they're selling uh, uh, turbo S's, four seaters, two seaters for anywhere from 45 to $70,000 right. and they're selling them, you know, and, and they're just loaded with everything that you could possibly fathom. Right. So that kind of makes me wonder whether or not uh, the Polaris and the Can-Ams of the world to kind of steer that at an OE level or let this, uh, dealerships like that kind of direct that. I think right. there's benefit to both. Yeah. So. And, and I think that with the way that the industry has changed because of the internet, right? Like, we can now be more vigilant on the products and the upgrades and the accessories and all that stuff. Um, and what's happening is that's just missed money for the OE, right? They're just saying we could have had those dollars and we're just letting them fly away. Uh, and so being able to do that, because I mean, the dealers aren't getting that money either, right? right? And the dealers are the heart of the OEs. Like if the dealers aren't selling units, the OEs are kind of screwed. So to prop up their dealers, the accessory game, the warranty game, all those things that you get upsold at the dealer is how the dealer makes money. They're not making a ton of money off the unit. So I think this package deal where they get shipped these upgrades and these pre kind of market um, configured units are really going to be pushing the dealer game further and making them more money because in the long run, you the individual is not going to be having to then go out, figure out which tire, which light bar, whatever. Um, and, and push that unless you're just one of those kind of guys. Right. Right. So, um, yeah, the future I think is going to be a lot more package based, uh, base units plus X plus Y plus Z. So, um, as far as, uh, other OEs in the industry, it's funny because we were talking about all the top brands and, we're, and I said, did, did I miss anyone? And then you came back up and repeated all the ones I said, and not either one of us said Arctic Cat. Or Textron. Yeah. And that that's curious to me because even though I have this in a bullet point on our on our show notes, like the fact that I didn't even bring it into my consciousness to bring that name up into that list proves my point of what's going to happen to Arcticat slash Textron, right? I don't think they're going to go anywhere. I think the, the manufacturer is going to still be there. But I don't think we see an Arcticat UTV or a Textron UTV in the consumer market in the next five years. Oh man, that's such a head scratcher. <laughs> you know, I, when I read that, I'm just going, "Oh man, well, what are we going to contribute to that?" Because there's, it, it's kind of quiet, very, it's very quiet. quiet. Yeah, yeah. I and don't know it, what's going on with that. I just came back from a couple different uh, snow shows where I was, you know, assisting in some dealer booths and things like that. And everyone, I mean, Arctic Cat's been huge in the snow industry forever. Like that's kind of built into their name, right? Yep. Um, and there's a lot of loyal, loyal customers that they just will not vary from that brand. Um, but the brand itself is disappearing. Like they're, they're not at shows. They're not representing the brand and the units. They're not showing off new technology. They didn't come out with any new models this year. Their, their, their buyout from Textron was at the time something we're all like, okay, is this going to be good or bad for them? And so far it's showing to be bad, right? It doesn't show any growth. It shows only decline. The, the fact that they're not going to shows to represent their product, they're not aggressively marketing. They're not marketing at all. At all, yeah. Uh, they're losing engineers. If they if they are, I'm not seeing it. I'd right. like to think that I keep up on that. They're losing engineers to the o other OEs. Um, I've heard firsthand accounts of that, um, where it's more of, you know, the OEs are going, hey, you want a place that's going to live? Then come with us. And, and then they're transferring over because there's no reason for them to stay. So I think that uh, all these signs indicate that Articat slash Textron is either going to have to go through a major, major redevelopment and rebrand, 
or they're going to have to either sell out to another brand or they're going to have to give us a reason to trust them because there's no trust in the brand right now. So all you Wildcat XX guys, you know, I feel sorry for you, son, but XX problems aren't one. So Yeah, it it sounds like we're kind of beating them up a little bit. It's just that there's no information out there. You know, we're we're just going off of what we're seeing, and I I would agree with you. I I think that that car is slowly but surely kind of fading away, and it's it's disappointing because I think it's a good platform. You know, I mean, (laughs) heck, we we may very well have a Wildcat in our booth at UTV Takeover in Coos Mm -hmm. Bay, and uh, the guy that built it, I mean, it's 400 horsepower to the wheels. He said he's going to hand me the keys for the whole time, so that's not going to suck. Well, I mean, just (laughs) just look at a car. Just look at what's happening with Speed UTV, mm-hmm. um, another brand we didn't bring up into that conversation. We don't know. But they're still yet pr- to be proven, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but that's basically an XX. Right. So Gordon owns all those patents and that suspension and drivetrain. They're not going to go anywhere. He's not going to let that investment disappear, right? So the, the cars themselves and the accessories for them are not going to go away. It's the fact that we're not going to see new models. We're not going to see them pushing the technology envelope unless they've got something up their sleeve, and that's why they're being so quiet. So, if which you look, is a possibility, which is definitely yeah. a possibility. I mean, Textron's big enough; they've got they're enough R and D to to push that through. Uh, I would just argue that they're failing on every marketing front at the moment. Um, but something that they've done that no one else is really doing is they're rebranding their units. They're, they're selling XX Wildcats as trackers, as UTV 1000s or whatever they call or them. Bass Pro Shops or... Yeah, yeah, all over the East Coast, right? So um, as far as I'm aware, there's not a whole lot different. I think they may have skimped on a few things here and there, but basically it's the same car, um, except that if anyone in the game knows what you're driving, they're going to laugh at you a little bit just for the fact that you bought it at Bass Pro instead of at a dealer. So, I mean... Image is everything. The... <laughs> The fact that they would be willing to let their brand equity and their R and D equity go and be devalued at a you know hobbyist store, basically. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Bass Pro. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with Cabela's or anything else like that. But it, what I'm but it's a head scratcher. But it's a head scratcher. Like yeah. it's it's almost like if you value your brand enough, you're not going to be selling it at Walmart. Right. Like Walmart has its place. There's nothing wrong with Walmart as far as my my opinion goes, but. You're not going to expect to see high-end products sold on the shelf at Walmart. Polaris isn't going to rebrand a a side-by-side for Costco, and it's going to be the Kirkland model. Exactly. Not going to happen. Right. So, Coincidentally, if you go to a Costco, you're going to see a Polaris out front. That's right. (laughs) (laughs) Which is funny. Right. Um, So... So as far as this, that's why that's why this topic is interesting to me. Like the state of the industry topic. Like where have we been? Where are we going? Because we have so many dynamic pieces at play right now. We have high technology investments. We have guys that are just running the course, like putting out new machines that are just good enough to be good and nothing more. And then we have guys that are somehow, for some reason, disappearing when they had good momentum. Right. And so, uh, you know. I think the industry is not done growing yet. I think that we're not oversaturated yet. Um, you know, you're not in Middletown suburban areas and seeing UTVs on every third house. Right, right. So we're not that saturated yet. But I think that there's still a point in time where we're going to see some of these guys drop off. And then we're going to see the bigger guys really take over and really saturate the market. Yeah, I mean, if if you go buy a Turbo S today, if you go buy an X3 today, I don't see anything happening in the next five years where that would base, basically make that car irrelevant. Right. Yeah, I think I think it's not going to get outdated for a long, long time. You know. So. In our, our last episode, when we were talking about which units to buy, the Turbo S was. My, one of my recommendations for at least three different categories. Yeah. And and it's not because I'm a Polaris guy, which I definitely have my preferences in that camp. Like, don't get me wrong. He's got like a, full disclosure. That's he, Zach's got a tramp stamp. It says Polaris. <laughs> so yeah, I got a star in my lower back. Uh, what can I say? Yeah. Uh, but um, that car is a proven multi-year proven platform that can show up at any event and perform to an expectation that anyone can set. I said in the last episode, I thought it was the most fun car to drive. Yeah. You know, and I still maintain that, you know, going, going to what we were talking about earlier in the show with riding around uh, Moses Lake in my X3, Mm -hmm. by comparison uh, to my YXE, the X3 makes things very, very easy to where you're not, it doesn't feel like you're challenging the car. The Turbo S has a lot of feedback. 
And I, I just, I think it's such a blast to drive. Right. Just, and and yeah. me saying that is not discounting any other OE or any yeah. other top tier product at all. Like the fact that I'm saying Turbo S and not Pro XP, you know, is one thing. Different market segment, I think. Well, but, now that I've had a taste of 72 inches, I'm not going backwards. So <laughs> <laughs> Turbo S. Yeah. If I was going to Polaris, that's the one. Yeah. So I'm not <laughs> discounting the top end Talon, the top end Yamaha, the top end Can Am. Um, what I'm the, basically the point is, if you if you're spending twenty grand or more on a UTV today, you're not going to be upset in a year, in two years, maybe Agreed. even three or four years. Agreed. Like, I've been writing XPs for the last three plus years. My very first tur- turbo would still be just as good a car today as it was then. Right. The XP that I had in eighteen, the XP that I had in nineteen, all would be great, perfectly suitable, make me completely happy, put a big grin on my face as the day I got them, as they would today. Um, you know, when you get into a car that has more horsepower, you get a bigger smile. But it's still a smile. Like, you're not... Nothing's being discounted on the one that you came from. So, I think we're starting to see a, a, a situation where it's almost like if you ever looked at the, the iPad market. Like, the iPads came out, and they were kind of good. They were kind of revolutionized the technology industry. And then two years later, they came out with a couple different versions. And then... The sales went through the roof because everybody saw it was good enough. But I have an iPad 2 that is just as good today as it was when it came out. Like, yeah, it doesn't have all the new fancy fingerprint, whatever's on it. But the same thing's happening in our industry. We're at a point now where all the machines are so good, as long as you understand what they are and how to ride them and how to respect them, they're so good that you're not going to be disappointed next year or the year after three years from now. Yeah. And so I think that's going to be the big challenge going ahead and i think there's certain players that are willing to accept that and start in kind of reshaping the expectation um i think the pro xp platform is going to be doing part of that for polaris but i think that beyond that they're going to like we said they're going to start talking about batteries and electronics and technology integrations like they bought trail tech they bought a number of different manufacturers that specialize in technology integration that you're going to start seeing these things like ride command today is going to look like a child's toy in three years i think yeah yeah, I think you're going to be talking about fully immersive, five, four, four or five G connected. Yeah, GPS like, that tracks your buddies, all that stuff. Right, yeah. and and we need that. Oh, for yeah, sure. I, I, I would put that to use tomorrow. <laughs> you know, I would argue that we need more third party players, but the problem is, is that when you get to that technology level, you can't you can't do that without large sums of money. Yeah, and so there's licensing com- that comes into that. There's patents that come into that. All that stuff is indicative of a big company with lots of money yeah i want to see some uh, i want to see some aftermarket companies that aren't involved in it today jump into the mix to you in like for overland stuff it'd be storage you know i would love to see wolfman i would love to see moscow moto i would love to see these companies that are just making like these elite storage options for dual sport motorcycles starting to cater them towards uh rzrs x3s i think it'd be uh, it's needed it's needed. Sure. You know, there are uh, there are some companies out there that make some great stuff, but you know, there's better options out there. There's companies like, like I said, like Wolfman, like Moscow, that make stuff that's just from another planet, just awesome, just right. super high quality. I would like to see things go a little bit more towards uh, UTV. So I think the uh, something while you started saying that, my my brain kind of went to the approach of. OEMs have a really bad habit of making everything locked into their ecosystem. Yeah. And when we talk about storage and upgrades and third-party components, they all require some sort of way to integrate. And the more open you can be, the more third-party integrations you're going to have. Yeah, and the second you change your cage, all that stuff that was built for the stock cage is you can't use it. Right. You know, I would like to th- see things be a little bit more, be able to integrate. Incompatible. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you talk about like, um, like I've brought up before the Draco guys making the flatbed general um, and showing that off recent over the last summer, right? Yeah. That was at the, sh- at SEMA. It was yeah. sick. It's, it's, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're just looking on your phone, flipping through Instagram and you see it, you're like, okay, somebody made a flatbed. Woohoo. Right. But in person, you see the practicality of it. You see the integration of it and what that means to what you can do with it after the fact, right? So when you're talking about storage options and you're talking about mounting options and you're talking about interplayability of putting things on and off and all that kind of stuff, having more natural mounting points like, you know, 
a flatbed or or you know a quarter twenty somewhere or a or a strap hook hole somewhere that's metal, not a plastic lip. Um, those types of things all make third parties just smile ear to ear because that's what means you're going to have more options, more innovation. And the problem that I see is that like players wants to do lock and ride and can am wants to do their little quick connect thing. And like everybody has these like little knickknacks that they consider for storage and for options and upgrades. And it's like, how about we just all gather around one system that, yeah, you can have more width or more depth or more height or more pieces or whatever, but we can all work together and have a, a more cohesive interconnected system. I think that would be a great option. Absolutely. Um, to really go uh, a little bit further on it, uh, where do you see the, the cost of these units going with all the tariffs and all the different like import uh, taxes and all these things that are happening uh, and manufacturing in the United States being something that is always a back and forth battle on what OEMs are doing. Like what, what do you see on the pricing? Um, you know, it, it's so early to speculate on that being in a manufacturer working for a manufacturer. I'm obviously we're kind of uh, beholden to those tariffs and yep. there's just so many rumors going around about them going away. Um, some of them already have, they've been drawn down a little bit. So, you know, I think we're going to learn a lot in about the next 90 days, 90 right. to 180 so days. So we have you know? a lot going on this next year, yeah. right? We got the yeah. elections and we got all these other things that are expiring and yeah. they're coming on board. Um, this is like the segue. We don't, we don't know. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, it, we're just, we're just speculating at this point. You know, I, I, I personally think a $40,000 UTV would sell. I, I think if it was just an absolute game changer, I have no doubt in my mind that it would sell. Um, I don't think anybody's going to want to go there first. You know, right. if somebody does, it'd probably well, be Polaris. Can. <laughs> well, yeah, forty thousand dollar max. You know, I mean, it, these things we've we've used the term trophy truck so many different times. You know, you take like a class one or a class ten, and if you don't know what those are, just Google it. Uh, class one, class ten Baja car. I think the DNA of the X3 kind of has that class 10 into it. And I think from an evolution standpoint, things could gravitate more towards those class one, class 10. I mean, obviously horsepower is going to be king, but, uh, you know, long travel stuff, stuff that's just made to dominate the desert. And a lot of people argue that Polaris and, uh, Polaris and Can-Am are, they're already there. So it's right. just kind of fine tuning what people want. What's that going to be? Is that going to be more power? Is that going to be more travel? Is that going to, you know, it's so just, I, the way I see it is the, in, there's, there's two things to consider. So one is people are already paying it. So why would they go backwards? Right. Right. But if we take into consideration kind of where my head is on like their package integrations, um, you know, no one's really doing, uh, a cheap sport side by side. No. Right. Um, and so what I'm, what I'm thinking is, for them to grow further, so 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 the big OEMs, Can-Am, Polaris, um, and even Honda's mentioned this at some point, they all recognize that most of the market currently is older white males, right? And they recognize that the next wave, the next big wave of purchasing is going to be in that millennial plus range of buyer. And those people aren't as much of... Uh, raw horsepower type people. They're more of features, technology, integrations, comfort, like how does this solve 10 problems in one type people? So they've all, the o, and this is the OE's talking, not just me. This is them saying, we recognize the next round of big purchasing power is with these younger people that are completely willing to spend money, but it's all going to be basically how can we enhance the experience of that purchase? Um, and so that's why like the packaging is going to become a bigger player. That's why the dealer is going to become a bigger player um, in assisting with that purchase because they're going to have to explain this is why this unit is going to be better for your experience than that unit. So what we've always talked about with like buying the unit that best fits you, right? The not just buying a Turbo S if you're going to be going down narrow trails, right? Like that discussion is going to be more important in the future. Um and I think that's going to reflect in the pricing. I think what's going to end up happening is you're going to get that base model at like 13.5. That's going to be stripped down, really hard, unusable shocks, you know, uncomfortable seats, all that stuff. And then these package deals are going to put it up to 15, 18, 19, 22, you know, 37 and higher, right? Yeah. And um, I think that's going to be the, the future of that growth is going to be in 
the individualized customization of that individual's vehicle. Yeah. Straight from the dealer, all in one payment because right. no one's gonna buy it up front in cash. Yeah, and it, and if uh, if somebody balks at a forty thousand dollar UTV, I would challenge them. I mean, my YXE out the door was sixteen eight, seventeen, somewhere in that ballpark. If I paid retail for every aftermarket component that was on that car, it would have been fifty five. Fifty five yeah. grand is what I had into that thing. So that thought process, what would be scary about a $40,000 UTV if it came with everything? Right. You know, I mean, if we went back 15 years, hit the rewind button 15 years and went to a engineer, uh, machinist, uh, and basically showed them an X3, say, build me that, you think it'd be 150 grand? At least. At least. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's the thing is that people just lose track and lose sight of the fact that the vehicles are so far ahead of their time like in their capabilities and what people, people think that just because they can go fast means that their expert expertise and their skill level is at such a level that everything's expected. It's like, just because we made it easy doesn't mean that it's just normal. Like right. these are still amazing vehicles. Yeah. And even, even if you go get a, a I don't know, a Razor 900 S like that is still an amazing vehicle That's compared killer. to like driving your Kia down For the sure. trail. Right. So, um, and you think about like a standard car, how much R and D and investment went into building that car versus what's went into these UTV vehicles. It's so much more optimized and more uh, aggressive in their, in their approach to designing and, and implementing, implementing technology and and advances in suspension and all this other stuff. Like that doesn't come just because some guy said, Oh, uh, from this list, I'll pick that one. It was like, there's engineers behind this, right? The, all these things are pushing this sport forward, pushing these vehicles forward. And uh, the value proposition in a sport UTV is just so much more dense. Yeah. Right. You know, and I had a question that was asked to me uh, at SEMA, and it, it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Uh, I, I kind of have my opinions on it. But basically, I was asked, do you think Japan's going to take this over? Like in five years, do you think Japan's going to take this over? I'm like, No. No, <laughs> I don't. No, nope. I don't. I think they're going to be a great contributor. No question about it. But uh, Polaris and Can Am are here to stay, for sure. I, I don't think they're they're not going to allow themselves to get lose market share. Right, you know, they're going to push mean, the envelope. the The sports side by side industry is uniquely American. Like you don't go to Brazil and see a UTV manufacturer pushing the envelope and building amazing cars. You don't go to Uruguay and say, "Hey." we have a, a tremendous off-road experience. So let's make cars and vehicles that support it. Like that's uniquely American. East coast hills and trails and West coast desert is what's driving this. Right. You know, they're kind of b- being built catered around the need of the American. <laughs> right. And the, and the side effect of that is there's plenty of countries that are willing to spend the money for that vehicle because they're used to spending a hundred grand, 200 grand, 300 grand on a sand rail or on a, hopped up truck or, or whatever, right? You could look at Dubai and all that stuff. They're just frivolous with their money. But you go other places like Europe, uh, you go to places like uh, South America where they're actually in the deep, like they're in the hills, they're in the jungle, yeah. they're in these places. Um, yeah, UTV is a big deal in uh, Russia, Mexico. Yeah, yeah, they're, they're starting to become more and more uh, popular uh, sites. Yeah. And so, and the reason is because they're lighter, they're faster, they're more capable, you know, it's, it just makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So uh, I'd be really interested to see what the future holds on the non-American market. I think that the question being posed on if Asia is going to take over, I think that has more equity in the European and like um, Russian markets, like you said. I think there's an opportunity for someone to come into that space and say, hey, we're going to take all the concepts, learn from them, implement something awesome and take over the market over here with all the European regulations and imports and all that kind of stuff where America can't really play as well as somebody that was natively over there. Yeah. Um, that being said, I want to put it past somebody like Can-Am or Polaris or um, Honda to do that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see in the next few years. Uh, um, Yamaha, you know, as it pertains to motocross, you would see these evolutions of these bikes about every four years. You know, they would come out with an overhaul. Uh, we're at the fourth year on the YXZ. So what's going to happen in 2021? That sort of stuff kind of gets me gets me really excited. You know, right. is, is Yamaha going to bring that thing out in 72 inches with a turbo? What are they going to do? You know, so. 
yes, that's that's also another fun conversation of what could an OE do different in two years, right? right? Like, I uh, you're starting to see the fruits of Polaris doing their thing. You're starting to see that Can-Am's getting to the long end of their tail, and they're, they're going to need to innovate here shortly. Um, you know, we got all the new players coming with their stuff, which are all just rehashed versions of what all the other OEs were doing. Um, but you look at somebody like Yamaha who did something different from the beginning, right? They had a different shape, different form, different chassis, different powertrain, different gearing, everything. No CVT. Yeah. Right. They were, they just did everything different. Yep. And, uh, it hurt them in a little bit of a way that, you know, their sales don't reflect it. It got know. labeled as a particular car, right? right? A dune car. So. so, but you look at that, that mentality, you look at their brute strength in their power store industry and in the, in the car industry and everything else, uh, what could they do in two years? Like, even if they stretched out another year, two years on the current platform and maybe did a couple upgrades or a couple power changes or whatever, if they were to take that out of the box mentality and say, we're going to do things different, the, the concept in your head kind of just goes wild. Like... Yeah, it, it, I don't think they have to completely reinvent a new platform either. I think the YXE could be made uh, with some modifications. I'd love to um, see them stretch it out to maybe 100 inches. I'd love to see them stretch it out to 72 inches wide. And uh, everybody wants more horsepower. And, I mean, right. yeah, I mean, the GYTR kit, uh, you can go to utvguide.net or something like that and do the review of the G- GYTR kit, and they talk about how much of a rocket it is, and that's only running at, like, 8 PSI. You know, there was this big debate online the other day of uh, X3 versus YXE, and guys in the X3 stomping all over the YXEs. Like, if you're stomping all over YXEs, you've never seen a fast YXE. Right. You know, if, I mean, a YXE running at 16 pounds of boost, which is what, you know, like two more pounds than what my X3 runs stock, they are no joke. They're right. pushing 230 horsepower to the wheels. You know, that's, that's why just... it's an interesting topic because they're, they have two dominate, dominant areas. They have the power if you want to put the money into it, and they have the handling straight out of the box. Right. Right? So the short course guys are all just loving those YXEs, and if you put the power into them, there's no competition whatsoever. And I've seen that firsthand at races. I've seen that um, at different events around the around the country. But if they were to stretch that to a hundred plus inches, you know that handling goes away. Like you would have to have some serious rack and pinion knuckle umph to handle that kind of turning radius in that kind of a wheelbase. But then you get a trade off for stuff like moguls, stuff like desert riding. You get a little bit more stability going through that. So it it is makes for an interesting debate. If 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 I could have any wish for Yamaha, it would be that they would evolve their current YXE platform and come out with a longer wheelbase platform as a secondary platform. Because if they could work those two platforms together in their R&D and have interchangeable suspension or power plants or anything like that, and it's more of like you just pick your... Even if it was like a four-seater YXE and they played that somehow to not look silly... Because it would probably would look really silly. It looks silly. Um, if they were able to play that chassis and make it look good, um, that could be like a Baja killer, like just with a few upgrades right there. So um, I think that if I were to wish anything on any OE right now, it would be that Yamaha steps up their game because they're capable. They're in a great place to take over a lot of racing market and a lot of eyeballs. Um, and I think that they have that driving experience that you've talked about before that people just don't have in any other vehicle. Yeah. And and I think I'll second what you just said there. And I think it's because the YXZ is so close to being an all around killer, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that it just wouldn't take much and modifications at an OE level to make this thing, not just a contender, but a real contender, <laughs> no right. doubt about it. I mean, you'd have Turbo S X3 and then a YXE. Yep. So, I mean, like if you read the reviews of the YXE versus some of the other Japanese manufacturers, uh, sport utility type rigs, uh, the YXE is amazing. Like uh, in a lot of those reviews, it actually wins, you know, and all those guys have got to be very politically correct yep. about how they do these write-ups. But if you read through the fine print, the YXE is dominating, like turning, got it, you know, drivetrain, got it acceleration no problem right so and i think the the biggest reason that they're not selling is creature comforts like you get into any cvt driven machine you just go in push the pedal and don't think about it Mm -hmm. and having shifting paddles and all that kind of responsibility 
reminds you of what you're trying to get away from that day to day driving experience. Right. And so, you know, um, both Yamaha and, and Honda, they all have these like hybrid automatic versions implemented into their systems. But I think that they have a huge opportunity to take what they've learned, what they have invested already and implement it into the best of both worlds and make it even better. Like not just say like we're making this capable and not taking user feedback to make it awesome, but taking that user feedback, that user implementation, that user experience and making an an amazing experience and then upgrading their creature comforts, upgrading the seating, upgrading the visibility, upgrading uh, just the, the things that you take for granted every day in any other OE yeah, I mean, the big thing is more power, more travel. You know, I, 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 when I drive that X3, I look for things that I know would slow my YXZ up, like a big, big, an aggressive dune face that, that I would hit with my YXZ and it would shave off a lot of speed. Mm-hmm. And there's none of that with the X3. It just plows right through it. And right. you got power right now. To ex- yeah, it's just, there, there's but a lot of But how that translates to the experience right. is the fact that you're saying, okay, I'm having to work towards this versus just experiencing going through it. Right. And that's where I think they have a huge opportunity. They can upgrade the shocks. They can upgrade the travel. They can upgrade whatever. They have plenty of horsepower if, they, if you want it. They, But when you're driving it, it feels more like work. Yeah. It we feels need more it like when you're OE trying level. to get away. Yeah, yeah, we need it at an OE level. You need to offer it from the factory so that people have a little bit more even of a starting spot. Yep. Yeah, and, and, and then going back to things like we talked about storage and aftermarket, like – because the adoption hasn't been there for the YXZ, all those oh, all those third mar- party options aren't there. Like there's there's plenty of options to do accessories, but there's not a whole lot of of these kind of like um, uh, mold changing options where you're saying it was this, now it's this thing that I wanted. Yeah, yeah. I actually have kind of a funny anecdote as it pertains to to Yamaha. The first Dune Fest where I met you, first Dune Fest I went to, there was a Yamaha engineer there. And he was uh, an engineer on the, the the YXE. And at the time, the YXE had been out about 18 months. Um, I'm there with my YXE, and they do an interview with me. And he's got an American marketing agent with him. And he's the translator. And this guy's English is just non-existent. Right, like he right. barely speak any English at all. So this marketing agent hits me up and he goes, uh, so why did you choose the YXE over, say, Polaris? I said, well, it was just kind of more intuitive. I felt a little bit more connected to the car. I wanted to do some driving and I felt like the YXE really gave me that that template, I like the idea of shifting. I like to be, I like the idea of having a full experience with the car, kind of being connected to the car. Coming from motocross just seemed like a, a simple transition. This dude literally looks at the at the uh, uh, engineer from Yamaha and goes, "Yamaha better than Polaris." <laughs> I you can't make this up. That's what he said. I'm like, that is not what I said at all. Exactly. <laughs> you know. So I mean, if 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 that is if, if that's the mentality that they're already putting out this great product, and then just people just are dumb by not choosing it, it's the wrong strategy, man. Well, I think that's why it's an easy answer to is Asia going to take over? I think the mentality there is so different than what could be. Yeah, what it is over here, yeah. like. You, you, and they're so dominant in some other stuff like uh, sport quads. Yeah, you know, for sure. Like the Raptor down to the 450s. Yeah. Motocross. I mean, forget it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I mean, but you're seeing the American companies catch up on that. Like the fact that Polaris came out with a 55 inch wide quad is just it's them. Nuts. <laughs> like that's just them saying, yeah, we understand. We're going to start being a little more aggressive on this. Well, yeah. And I'm not a quad rider, but I have hopped onto a couple of quads where you like can ams. You can't even get, keep the front tires on the ground. Right. They're nuts. <laughs> <laughs> but if you go down south, like, that's yeah, all they want to do. <laughs> for real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Anyways, the, 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 the discussions can go on forever on the speculation of the industry and, and all that. And I think it's just a fun kind of recap at the end of the year to kind of go through, you know, where are we at and what, what do we think needs to happen in the future, future years? Um, there's just so much kind of at play right now. That's just an unknown. Like we as an industry outside of the always R and D departments just don't have a clue on where they're at as far as what they've tried, what they failed at, what they're moving past, what they're moving on to, uh, what they're going to be testing next. Like we just don't have that insight. Right. So, um, we can only hope and dream. And I think the future is bright for the industry for at least the next five, maybe 10 years before we start slowing down from market saturation. Um, you know, the, the prices, the, there's a discussion about used unit saturation and how, at what point does it start impacting sales of new units? 
And I think we're probably a good few years out from that. But here's my other take on that. When was the last time you saw a used UTV sport side by side in a shape that you'd want to buy it? There is no world that exists that I would buy a used UTV. <laughs> right? So, so I think that there's a market for the guy that's just trying to get in and he needs to get something cheap so that he can validate his decision and then yeah. move on to a new unit later. But I think that, first of all, the selection of those units is very low. And I think that the, the, the pile of crashed, wrecked, insurance-claimed units is just growing higher and higher and higher. If I buy a used unit, it's because I'm tired of riding alone and I need something for my buddy to ride. That, <laughs> that's the only way I'm buying a used unit. I can, I yeah. can, I can get on board with that. Yeah. Um, or, or just upgrade and keep the, second, the first unit or whatever. And I think go. that's kind of where I almost market, did that with the YXE. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's where the market's going to end up. Like you, got, you talk to the guys with quads. You talk to guys with dirt bikes like – they they do cycle and and resell those units, but typically what happens is the one that they had goes down to the next person, and then they get the new one. Yeah. Or the son gets it, or the daughter gets it, or the wife gets it, or whatever. Like, it all kind of trickles downhill in motorsports, and um, I foresee that being uh, a big impact on the used market for UTVs. But on the other hand, we have no way to uh, currently on the market no way to validate and do a full inspection on units to say that this is a valid really good unit to buy even though it's used right we don't have you know carfax for utvs we don't have uh what's what's the is it carmax or whoever does the certified used cars like we don't have that for utvs right right Um, and and i i would warn anybody that's going to jump into their first utv about potentially buying a used one like like if i were going to go buy a used yxe i know exactly what i need to look for from a wear point and stuff like that but yeah yeah so I don't know. Maybe there's an opportunity there for someone to start a business on that. And I'll tell you, one of the main reasons why I didn't keep the YXE is if it was a second car for me and I was going to take it certain places and let my buddy drive my second car, I can't put them in the YXE because the YXE (laughs) requires such a specific driver. You know, you you have to know how the car behaves and I wouldn't feel comfortable putting somebody into that thing right off the bat. Yeah, there's a lot of... Whereas Can-Am's just throwing high hit the gas. And that goes back to my, like, how easy is it to drive, right? Like right. there's a certain skill level that goes into some of these manual transmission cars that, um, while it's, you know, paddle shifting, it's not like clutched yeah. or anything. It's still thinking. Yeah. And up in the mountains, probably not a big deal unless you're doing hill climbs. Sand, you got to know what you're doing. Absolutely. On, on a YXE. Or as a Can-Am, you got the power, Turbo S, you got the power to just kind of throw it into an obstacle and let it figure it out. Right. <laughs> So yeah, um, so as far as the discussion on used used mark the used market, we could almost dedicate a show to that. <laughs> yeah, for sure, and especially it's it's interesting because it's so dynamic based on the actual manufacturer. Like everyone has their little things that just you have to look for, and you have to know that it's going to get replaced or repaired or whatever. Um, and it's not common across all OEs. So uh, definitely an interesting topic that you know you could we could dive in further. Uh, especially on the value proposition, like which ones are the value, which ones would you have to invest more and less in things like that. So anyways, that's kind of why, uh, that was kind of my just state of the industry kind of talk. Yeah. Uh, I think it's always fun to do that. Um, generally speaking, that's what I would say half of UTV discussions are (laughs) (laughs) is, is what do we have and why is it here? Right. Right. So anyways, um, yeah, uh, we don't really have a lot, a lot of events coming up. Uh, the industry is kind of going into hibernation until spring. Um, but we do have one last trade show uh, in Scottsdale, Arizona, the International Off-Road and UTV Expo. Yeah, that's uh, <coughs> Rugged Radio's putting that guy on. And uh, I, I was there a couple of years ago. It was fantastic. Yeah, so if you're okay with flying into Phoenix and dealing with Phoenix traffic and heat, then it's a great place to go. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's just far enough away from downtown that you can feel like you're not in Phoenix. So Yeah, you know, uh, one thing I, I have been following on social media, it looks like UTV Takeover is going to be announcing their calendar for uh, 2020 probably. If I had to take a stab, probably somewhere within the next – Two weeks. Give yeah, it, they're give they're getting close on solidifying all their permits and everything. Yep, yep. And then we have they've got uh, some exciting stuff to announce. Yeah, so we we definitely have a full year of of uh, events coming up that um, you know aren't solidified yet until you get into the new year. So uh, yeah, looking forward to that. Um, I have a pick because I always show something off. So <clears throat> my boy's birthday is coming up, and uh, just, he's always wanted to 
a more capable RC car. Uh, we've always gotten him kind of the cheapies, but he's getting old enough now. A better car is a better proposition, right? So uh, this is the Axial uh, Yeti Junior Can-Am Maverick X3, and uh, retails for about 150 bucks. Uh, and I'll tell you, it has been a blast. So we got one for my boy, and we got one for me. And uh, it has all replaceable parts, has um, full suspension front and back, actually has real shocks in it, has real springs, independent suspension, uh, solid rear axle, or not solid rear axle, um, uh, full front and rear diffs. Um, and uh, it has low, medium, and high speed settings, so you can do rock crawling with it as well as racing. Uh, we've taken it out. You can do wheelies with it. You can do you know, all sorts of fun stuff with it. And uh, uh, we've had a lot of fun with it, and I recommend it for anyone looking for uh, maybe something that is more radio controlled for their uh, family members this holiday season, or even if you're just a UTV driver uh, that wants to have some fun in the backyard or whatever, it kind of uh, makes those days where you can't get out and drive uh, a little easier. So uh, highly recommended. Uh, only 150 bucks. I mean, that sounds a lot for a kid's toy, but when you look at the uh, rest of the RC world, you know, you're looking at 300 plus to get into a basic kit. So uh, this has replaceable shell, replaceable shocks, replaceable suspension, replaceable wheels, axles, servos, all that stuff. It's splash proof and all that. So you can get, you know, through the water puddles and all that stuff. So it's a great option for, for kids that like to break electronics. And have some fun around the house while there's four feet of snow outside. Exactly. In the next few months. So. Yep. So it's always fun to set up an obstacle course in the garage and jump it off a piece of wood or something and, and all that. So that's my pick for the week. Um, another good episode, Ian? Absolutely. Uh, what are we creeping up on two hours now? Oh, yeah. We're the, about an hour always, and a half. Yeah. This always happens when we get together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so, um, yeah, we're looking forward to, uh, the holidays here. We're going to try to follow this up with a holiday specific episode to kind of go over some best buys and stocking stuffers that you guys would, uh, be interested in, uh, as well as if you are a, uh, retailer or an OE that has specials you'd like to promote or maybe get out in front of the community, let us know. Uh, we'll try to include you as well. And uh, we'll have both web and video and audio versions of, of uh, that episode as well. So uh, looking forward to that. Looking forward to Thanksgiving coming up here soon. Uh, not necessarily personally looking forward to Black Friday or anything. I don't do that anymore. Yeah. But, uh, but I'm looking forward to seeing what kind of deals we can get our, our community, community members and, and uh, see what kind of uh, interesting gift ideas people come up with. So if you have any ideas, let us know. Send them to podcasts at sidebysideguys.com or our website. We have a submission form you can use. Uh, hit us up on social, DM, uh, whatever you are more comfortable with. Yeah, make sure you follow on the YouTube channel as well. Obviously, the, that's a great place to find the podcast, but uh, there's a lot of product review stuff, some install stuff. Uh, we did a we did a little video um, over the X3 over yep. the last couple of weeks, and we did a video on uh, replacing a tie rod on a YXE, yep. and that's going to continue. We're going to have a bunch of stuff. I, as a matter of fact, uh, for the X3, I've gotten a handful of products that were sent to me, uh, uh, battery upgrade type stuff, uh, uh, addiction motorsports down in uh, Woodland, Washington. Washington was nice enough to send a, uh, 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 basically it's this clamp that goes over the top of a, a battery that's going to be about twice the size of stock battery on the X3. We'll do that install. We'll, we'll film it and yeah, for put sure. it up. And yeah, just a lot of stuff to be seen on, yeah, that, on that YouTube page. We have a lot of, I have a lot of videos to finish for on sure. my plate uh, that have been installed. Um, so look for those to be coming out uh, fairly shortly. Uh, we're getting finished with our garage uh, remodel. So that's going to be a new filming location for us where we've done some stuff in the garage in the past. This will be more of a native experience for doing uh, video of products and installs and things like that. So super excited to to get out there and, and show you some new products and new things um, as, well, as well as some educational stuff. So um, we're still looking at a number of videos with some industry partners to do educational stuff. And uh, so if you are a, um, a, a manufacturer or a brand of certain equipment uh, pieces that can aid in certain scenarios, you know, we'd love to, to get to know you and to maybe feature your products uh, because I really want to make this a place where we can learn and experience different products, different uh, uh, trail systems, things like that, where we're not just pushing out you know, advertising. We're actually 
using stuff and and educating and helping you make the right decision on your purchase. Yeah, we're so. going to beat on it. No question about it. Whoa. Yeah. What are we doing? Coming in hot. Whoa. <laughs> Well, that got interesting. Yeah. So on that note, follow us on YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram. Uh, our podcast is available on iTunes, Google Play. Um, is it even iTunes anymore? Apple Podcasts. There Apple you go. Podcasts. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, uh, uh, Spotify, and all the different areas that you would find your podcast, as well as on YouTube for the guys that like watching stuff or playing stuff on their TV. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining me, Dean. Sayonara. See ya. Peace. Peace.